as we settle in today's session and will be a conversation and I did want to encourage everybody to ask questions at any point and I will try to include them as we move along throughout the morning. Uh, before we get started, I did want to take an opportunity to uh, thank our sponsors from Healthcare Canada, Healthcare Excellence Canada, Jennifer Zelmer, uh, from Health Pro, Christina Donaldson, from Hiroc, Philip D'Souza, from IQVIA, Robert McKay, from Medtronic, uh, Melissa Laver Sally, from Medivy, Jacqueline Zonneville, Microsoft, Peter Jones, Navari Health, John Sinclair, Teladoc, Zenya Kayat, and TELUS, Darren Larson. So thank you very much to all of the people who are supporting today's event. Um, so we are all ready to go. Uh, thank you for joining today. I am Matthew Hart, CEO for Longwoods and producers of these events. I am joined today by Helen Angus. After a number of years in the uh, ministry and the Ontario government, Helen joined AMS Healthcare about a year ago. And Cameron Love, who has been with the Ottawa Hospital for a number of years and took the helm about three years ago. To start off, I would like to ask Helen to just maybe go into a little bit about uh, AMS Healthcare and just give us a little background and a little bit of your work. For sure. Thank you. Great to be here today and uh, delighted to introduce you to AMS Healthcare if you don't know us. Uh, we are a Canadian charitable organization. We were created 85 years ago. And our mission is really to, be to catalyze positive change uh, in the healthcare system. And over the last few years, we've really oriented our mission to compassionate care. That seems to have a lot of resonance in the healthcare system. And our job is in supporting healthcare providers, emerging leaders, educators, policymakers, um, to really instill a foundation of compassion um, at the heart of the healthcare system. Probably talk a little bit later on about some of the work that we do in supporting uh, fellows and some of the programs that uh, we bring to the Ontario healthcare system. We're also um, Canada's largest funder of uh, history of medicine. And so we have that sort of larger arc of history that we bring to contemporary problems. Thank you. Um, Cameron, maybe the same sort of question for you, if you could maybe just go into a little bit about your experience with uh, the Ottawa Hospital and the work that you guys are currently working on. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for uh, having us here today, Matt. So um, I think many of you uh, know a little bit about the Ottawa Hospital, but for those of you that don't, we're a, a fairly large academic hospital um, that services pretty much all of Eastern Ontario. So we're a little bit unique from the perspective where we do about 70% of all adult care in this entire region. Uh, and for those of you that remember the 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 Lynn or the the Lynn regions, we were the previous Champlain region. So from pretty much Barry's Bay to Cornwall, up to Hawkesbury, all of Western Quebec, and all of Nunavut. Uh, and so we've, we've got about 1,200 beds, um, 19 sites across the region. We run all the sort of regionalized complex care programs um, for the region. I think most notably, though, particularly on today's topic, the other piece that we spend a lot of time on is education, research, and innovation. Uh, and over the course of the last probably three, four or five years, uh, spending a, a huge amount of time in terms of how we create a platform in terms of embracing technology and how we innovate around technology through partnerships with companies ranging from those that are established to those that are startups. Uh, and I think it's a field that has really started to evolve very, very quickly. We saw it evolve very quickly through the pandemic. We're seeing it evolve even at a faster rate now. And so I think for many academic centers, including ourselves, there's a, an evolution as we try and grow research of what we do with innovation and how we expand uh, platforms around innovation. Uh, and so it's been very much part of what we do now for the course of the last couple of years. And I think it's gonna set a bit of a future course for definitely for us, but probably for many other academic institutions as well across Canada. Thank you. Um, so Helen, can you maybe go into a little bit uh, about why AMS got involved in in this work and you know the technology enabled healthcare. Yeah. So I guess a few things. You know, when we looked out across the healthcare system, I think two main drivers that you know technology is and will continue to disrupt um, the current ways of delivering healthcare. Um, and so we wanted to understand that better uh, in order to anticipate it and actually start to shape it. The other thing that I think was maybe a little more proximate is the, the mismatch that we're seeing between the supply of the health workforce and the demand and the health needs of the population. And really thinking that 
the efforts to increase more healthcare workers alone probably wasn't going to solve that problem and that technology was going to play a role and uh, certainly have seen opportunities to expand human capacity uh, by either automating tasks that are routine or by augmenting the work of people in order to make them more efficient and more effective, but also augmenting in a way that allowed for the human connection between providers and their patients, which are really the things that, that motivate people to get into healthcare um, in the first place. So we saw some challenges in terms of how do we introduce technology into the workforce? How do we prepare for new skills, new jobs, and new ways of working? Because we thought that that would be a sort of natural consequence of, of the sort of you know, the, the technology innovations, and then how to give people a reason to work in healthcare. Does that make sense to you, Cam, as somebody who's kind of obviously running a large yeah. organization? So that was our assessment anyway. Yeah. Uh, did this approach work? Yeah, we, we, I think we have a pretty good understanding now, and we went through a pretty rigorous process to understand this. And so we commissioned the McMaster Health Forum uh, to look at how technology would shape the delivery of healthcare. We tried to understand how technology would or would not address some of the health, the pressing workforce challenges. And you know, it's not a it's not a slam dunk, right? There are there are some data that show that actually the introduction of technology has decreased productivity if if done poorly or uh, you know in sort of more complex ways. And so how to make it actually additive and, and a huge benefit to, again, the workforce challenges. So we went through a process that McMaster uses and, and John Labus led that with an evidence brief. We had uh, expert reviewers, we had a stakeholder dialogue, and then we brought about 200 people to Toronto for an in-person conference. And we had over 10% patient and caregivers to give us their perspective. And I think it really, that process kind of fine tuned uh, are thinking um, on this topic. And uh, shortly in June, you'll actually see the outputs from the conference where we had people do table exercises and really give us some good solid recommendations about where to go. Is, is just quickly, is uh, that um, output uh, paper going to be publicly available? Absolutely, yes okay. it is. Okay. So technology is, is is always changing um, and it's moving. How how should we think about technology? What is in that sort of um, technology bucket? Maybe I'll let Cameron, you're, sure. you have a good idea about that too. So I, I think it's a good question. I think to Alan's point, the, 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 the exercise that um, McMaster did with John, um, I think it really identified um, how people really embrace technology, but it really started to identify what are the what are the thing what are the opportunities, but also what are some of the risks and some of the considerations in terms of how we enable technology. And I look at you know I think all all hospitals use lots of technology. I think the academic centers um, I would suggest we we look at it sort of from three or four buckets. Um, I think there's a there's a generalized delivery model with technology. So whether you're looking at anesthetic machines or ventilators or CTs or MRIs, there is always bits and pieces of um, technology advancement allows you to change generally a little bit around process as that technology evolves, but it's it's kind of the, the bread and butter of what we use, but it continues to advance every year. And so there's a kind of a run of the mill delivery side of technology. There is very much a transformation side of technology, and we've seen that for a number of years. And so when you look at things like robotics and some of the things that come in that have completely changed the trajectory of how we do surgery, those, those platforms continue to evolve. And they're, very, they're quite transformational because they allow you to change the way uh, models work, outcomes work, uh, or what outcomes are achieved, uh, what labor is required. They're, they're fairly transformational. I think it's the third bucket that is really starting to evolve, which I classify into this innovation bucket. And artificial intelligence is a perfect example. And what we're really starting to see is lots and lots of dialogue with companies that either have startups or apps or functionality like artificial intelligence that is really <clears throat> starting to drive how healthcare can truly be um, mm -hmm. exceptionally innovative. Um, and what's interesting with those, and I think this is the third piece that's really important to this, 
is there is very much a value equation discussion that has to be thought about. Uh, and so when you're talking about bucket one with delivery, the value has already been proven. You're just upgrading technology. The transformation, the innovation stuff, there are ideally what you're doing is you're creating uh, innovation platforms and you're um, using technology to either transform or advance systems that are going to improve quality and increase cost. The catch is if you don't have a platform to evaluate them, a lot of times you can improve quality, but your, co your cost profile may go through the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, and in other times, if you can't monitor quality, it may be stable and you're actually adding more, uh, more cost into a system uh, that requires a support structure. And that's where a lot of times we see, see things fall short. And so as for us at TOH, and I think you'll see this in other many other centers, we tend to bucket these things and you build frameworks and how you manage them across those three, three buckets of how technology evolves. Um, part of the challenges is how you come up with capital and money to drive some of these, which has been the case for 100 years, it'll be a case for the next 100 years. But I think what we're seeing is a lot more interest from uh, private sector companies or startups that are willing to put capital into these things to really drive a change. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I'm struck by is when we started this in September of 2022, um, we didn't know about chat GPT. We knew something that might be coming down, you know, generative AI that would have sort of great retail exposure. Uh, and uh, that really emerged, um, you know, through the, the late fall and winter. And by the time I, we got to the digital health conference uh, about a week ago, there were already startups that were using, you know, generative AI, chat GBT technology to record the uh, conversations between a physician and a patient and then transform that input into the prescribed format of the of the health record. And, you know, that's kind of fascinating. So keeping up with this, I think, is also uh, really important because it is already, you know, changing Um you know, at least in some contexts, you know, a lot about the patient provider relationship. So, so the, the, there's going to be a lot of policy dialogue and a lot of policy discussions and stuff like that. What do you learn from these policy processes and these dialogues? What, what, what are we learning? Yeah. I mean, I was struck and Karen, you were part of that too, but if you think about the, the leaders in the healthcare system want to get this right, I think is important. So there's a lot of goodwill and interest. Um, and I would say it's not a matter of putting the technology into the current system. So it didn't take very long in the policy dialogue process to start talking about, um, you know, what, what is the transformation that we're looking for? How is this going to help us build to a different uh, delivery system? And so it isn't automating the present. It actually is very connected to the idea of doing a better job for, for patients. And so uh, the conversation that, that we had as part of this process was very much about, you know, what is the leadership required to drive transformation? How do we try to get it right? Um, how do we make sure that particularly in primary care that uh, we are supporting that very important aspect of, of healthcare delivery in, uh, in any conversation around, you know, the potential uses of technology. And uh, with great, you know, respect to Cameron, that the, that the benefits that we realize um, accrue beyond the, uh, the, the acute care system and that it actually starts to touch home care and primary care and, you know, public health and other parts of healthcare so that, uh, we can work together differently. And so I think there's a, it's, it's, it's a starting point for a bigger conversation is what I got out of it. Did Not you want to add to that Cameron? Yeah, or? Yeah, yeah. yeah, just to add for having been part of the process, I think um, <clears throat> a couple of points to add to what Alan, Helen said, which I agree with. Um, it was, it was actually a very interesting discussion um, and lots of, lots of varying opinions, but really good opinions around um, policy direction. I think on a, on a positive side, Dad, what Helen said, there is, there is no shortage of this system wanting to embrace technology. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so the starting point is exceptionally positive. Um, I think as we look at technology from a policy decision, uh, Helen's right, it's not about acute care, it's about programmatic care. 
And so when I, you know, when you when you think about other jurisdictions worldwide, I think as we start, if you get rid of the words hospital, long-term care, community care, and you start talking about what are you doing for mental health population, or what are you doing for the care of the elderly, or what are you doing for, you know, a surgical population, you start thinking about this as a health system, what you start to appreciate is how technology can integrate care programs together uh, and build capacity in the community and integrate it with hospital or vice versa. Uh, and so I think that was a theme that really evolved there. And a lot of the technology that we're seeing that's evolving, like look at virtual care, it's probably the most basic example of this now mm -hmm. that we saw through the pandemic. For us, we used to do like six, seven, eight, ten percent virtual care. Through the pandemic, we did 90%. Everybody was being cared for in their home setting. Um, now it's swung back a little, uh, back and forth a little bit as we've come out of the pandemic, but that's probably the most basic example. So I think part of technology and evolution of policy is how we create more depth of a, of a health system and not just sort of silos that benefit from, from technology. Uh, so that's point one. I think the other one is uh, that came out was loud and clear is um, the the capability for us to embrace technology is a very significant economic driver for Canada and the province. Uh, and I think there's an element to this that we really have to think about in terms of how we've got all that we've got lots of intellect, we've got lots of recognition nationally and internationally um, as sort of leaders in various fields and domains. How do you embrace that to create Canada or Ontario or wherever across Canada as, as a real spot, much like you've seen Israel and other countries do that really embrace partnerships that innovate around technology? And so I think there's a huge opportunity around that. And then I think the third one that came out in that was a lot around um, as, we, as we sort of embrace these technologies, Part of the challenges at times are what are we doing with procurement that came out loud and clear that's not to say procurement is a you know a really bad thing but it does you know there's thinking around what how we how we shift this to enable more uh, innovation with technology and then the last piece is how do you how do you create a model and a change that ensures your compliance and adoption is really high um, and that was probably the third theme that came out of this with lots of good thoughts around it so so Cameron, you're you're at not to toot your horn too much, but you're at one of the premier teaching hospitals in Canada, um, <laughs> and you've been running it now for three years. Um, what sort of things are you learning from that, from running a, a you know a large teaching hospital? Yeah. So um, good question, Matt. So I. Uh, you know, like all academic centers across Canada, obviously, I know the ones best here in Ontario, we tend to focus on three different areas. One is clinical delivery, the other is education, and the third is discovery or research and innovation. What I tell you is for us to keep pace uh, in providing um, sort of standards of care, developing standards of care, or leading care, you have to have strength around research and innovation and embrace technology. That's a given. Um, and same thing with what we do for education. Lots of technology is evolving how we you know, teach the future generation. And so there's almost everything we do now has this element of, um, of uh, a framework by which you drive change and how you embrace technology. And so uh, it's, it's, not really a, it's not really a discussion of whether there's a benefit anymore. It's, it's a discussion of how you embed it within, within the organization. And so all of our programs, whether it's critical care, eMERGE, um, uh, medicine, surgery, all three main focuses, a lot of what we do now in terms of driving change is really driven around what are we going to do with, what are we going to do with technology? How do we buy technology? And how do you create opportunity both financially and operationally through partnerships with innovation? And so that is that has probably been the biggest shift over the last two or three years, um, ironically through the pandemic that has really started to evolve. Uh, I think what else is um, a bit of a, a, a important challenge with this though, that we really have to think about is there's only so much change you can manage at once. And part of what I find in, in probably any organization, but you can bite off more than you can chew very quickly. And then all of a sudden you start to get a bunch of failures. Uh, and so there's a, there's a structure, a process and a framework required to make sure you execute effectively and get the true benefit out of it. And then, the, and then I think there's also a component here to what Helen said, a lot of what we're focused on is not what we do in the hospital. It's what we do to support building capacity in the community. 
a lot of hospitals today, I can only speak to uh, ours specifically, but a lot of what comes to hospital today does not need to come to hospital. It can actually be embedded within the community, but you got to create structure and process and put technology into the community that's integrated with the hospital. And so there's a there's a huge push around that. Um, and then the last one that I think is really, um, I think it's a challenge for the system. It can be a challenge within the hospital is there are many times we'll roll out a piece of technology and 50% of people will not want to use it. Mm. And so how do you, how do you create a framework that is a change management process? Cause there's no point in investing in something if 20% of people are going to use it. And so there's a big change management exercise that goes with these to get the adoption and manage the change, uh, manage the change with it. Uh, and so that it's really sort of, for the last sort of five years in particular, those things that I've just spoke about is really how we build a robust framework by which you really capitalize on the benefit of it. And many times you have to invest support structures to actually benefit from the technology you're putting in place. So there, there's there's a few questions um, that are coming in now, and a, a couple of them kind of lead into my le- my next question for you. So I was going to ask about how do we implement this technology. Um, so I, I know probably both of you know Francesca, um, and she she's asking that simple little question that's been asked for years and years and years. Um, when are we getting rid of the fax machine? <laughs> All right, and and then the the other kind of question that kind of also works into how do we implement technology now are what are the barriers for rolling in innovations across the hospital system? Mm-hmm. All right, so I don't know if you'd be able to address those. Well, why don't I start with what we heard from the process and then maybe Cam, you can mm-hmm. add to it. So we did hear from the people who were, you know, part of the McMaster process about the bandwidth issue in terms of driving change on how many fronts all at the same time and both policymakers and health system leaders. So that was a concern. Uh, we heard about the uneven digital infrastructure across sectors. So, you know, more advanced in some places, less advanced in others. And how do we then, you know, bring those sectors up that that need uh, the support and uh, need the infrastructure? Some tension between sort of top-down, bottom-up uh, approaches. Uh, but I would say there's also some optimism uh, because they drew down, you know, there were, we have had some success in health transformation. Um, and uh, the, the examples were, you know, the health people went back to the Health Restructuring Commission, they went back to uh, the work at Cancer Care Ontario and other examples that may be provincial lo- or local. So we have some muscle memory around transformation. We've got an appetite for digital health solutions. And uh, they had some, um, you know, I think support for the work of Ontario health teams and the uh, sort of building out a system around primary care. So that's what we heard from the people who are part of the process. I would say, if you're going to implement technology successfully, you you have to ask the questions about for whom and make sure that people aren't left behind. And I think uh, you know maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the the health equity dimensions. But the you know the lessons from COVID um, are still very top of mind. Certainly as I look at this work and think about how do we implement this with a, you know, a really sharp focus on improving rather than detracting uh, from, from health equity. I don't know if you have other thoughts, but. You want me to comment on that, Matt? Yeah, yeah my, oh, absolutely. So, so uh, just maybe to add to Francisca's first question around the fax machine, which you know, everybody asks, where, when are we going to get rid of the fax machine? I think it's a, it's a, at the highest level, it's a fair comment because in this day and age, we really shouldn't have a lot of paper. We shouldn't have a lot of faxes. But I think what it speaks to is trying to create a, um, this concept of a, a health system that is integrated on platforms that speak to each other. And so uh, I think, you know, what you've seen over the course of the last uh, probably decade uh, is most hospitals have started to roll out either Epic or Cerner. Um, and, you know, if I look in the province right now, 62%, I think, of hospital beds are on Epic and most places are on Epic. And then the remainder, for the most part, are on Cerner. And I think there's a few left on Meditech. And at, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter whether it's Epic or Cerner or Meditech. The point is, is you've got to have, if we're going to start to integrate models. And so if I look at our shop, we have 19 sites. So if you're a 
If you're a nephrologist, there's 14 sites you potentially can work on to be dialyzing patients. They're all on Epic. They're all integrated. It's one chart. doesn't matter where you go. It's the same process when you go to the other site. And so from the point of view of acute care, it, it starts, it's really important if we're going to start to shift and move services around and make them more efficient. Here's the interesting thing is if you're a patient in the community or in any community and you have a chronic disease, you're going to spend a fraction of time in hospital and the bulk of your care for your entire life is going to be in the community. But it's completely separated when we start talking about systems and technology. And so I think over the course of time, and I think a plan is evolving with what uh, government in Ontario Health is doing is as we've done more and more, we work with CHCs and OHTs and family health teams. One of the big pieces to embrace is, are we putting them on Epic or are we putting them on a standard flat platform that you're going to integrate with Epic? So regardless of where the patient's moving and where providers are moving, you've got one standard platform. And I think until we, until we, until we can get to that point, you're always going to have these um, separate systems that don't speak to anyone or individual um, shops or practices or community health centers that don't have the capability to roll out a system. And so they use fax and paper. And so, I, you know, what it should be is it should be an enabler to integrate care for, let's say, the mental health population, not a driver of how we, you know, provide mental health care. And so I think it, it's got to be a bit of both, but I think what, what we really, what we're going to have to start to do and see more of is how do we create that infrastructure in community settings? Uh, because the bulk of care for most patients is done in the community. It's not done in the hospital. Episodically, they're, you know, they're in their most vulnerable state from a, an acute care perspective is when they come to hospital, but our average length of stay is seven days and then you're back into the community. And so when we talk about long-term care in these other places, I think what we're going to start to see is how do we create more of this integrated system? And I think to Francisca's point, when we get there, you'll be able to eliminate the facts. But if you, if you, if we, let everybody have a choice of system and we're going to have, you know, 25 different systems, some without, some with them, some without them. You're never going to get to that point of full integration. Yeah. So we've discussed a lot here and there's going to be a lot of challenges, a lot of work ahead. Um, how do you ensure, or how do we make sure that we have the right leadership in place? How does that happen? Yeah. Great question. I think, uh, and what we kind of heard was that, you know, technology, particularly AI, because AI has a you know particular set of attributes, is going to create opportunities, uh, but also challenge some of the norms in the system around hierarchies and how work is organized. And I think that requires, it requires leadership. And we're really looking at leadership at, at all levels. It's not just at the C-suite. I think it's throughout the healthcare system. And then if you kind of back that up, a bit more. What does it mean to have, you know, leaders, uh, you know, embodied at sort of at multiple levels in organization? And how do we get, you know, the diversity of ideas and histories and perspectives? And what kind of partnerships do we need? Um, and how do we in, in, involve and invite the experience of, of end users and communities really to, to drive the change? So I think it's the, the sort of social wear um, of, of leadership that's going to be really important because all of this is really driving towards more seamless team-based care. And so uh, I think there's sort of an upping of the, the capabilities of leaders to work in this space. I'll put a shameless plug in for the AMS Healthcare Fitzgerald Fellowship. And so that's, you know, it's uh, going to, we are going to be working with the, the Dalana School to train up mostly mid-career, early mid-career professionals who are in leadership positions to understand and manage in, in an ethical way the um, the use of AI in their in their work context. You know, it's 12 people a year that will be trained through that, but I think we need more of those kinds of programs and retooling even at, at the executive level to make sure that we're optimizing and not falling into some of the pitfalls and challenges of some of the technology that we're seeing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Matt. I, I think, um... <clears throat> Uh, to add to Helen's point, I, I think our place of starting from leadership in, in this in this entire sector or healthcare system is really strong. We're, we don't have shortage of leadership um, by any stretch of the imagination. So if I look at you know varying levels, if you go into hospitals or into community care organizations, um, 
I'd suggest to you that, and I can only really speak well to hospitals, but when I look at programs and structures, <clears throat> we've got really strong leaders that actually embrace this concept of technology and innovating and trying to do what's right to you know, build a stronger quality program. And that, that's been evolving for a decade. And so I, I don't think we've got um, uh, any challenges there other than, as I said before, you know, making sure we've got proper structure and framework for decision-making and those types of things. I, I think where we're starting to see it evolve, and this is a positive comment, is you can see it all across the country on what Alberta has done, New Brunswick's done around creating some structure and process is going to drive uh, sort of standardization of what we do for embracing technology. Um, so whether it's Ontario Health or it's Supply Ontario or other bodies within government, I think we're starting to see a lot of leadership around creating some structure and process that is going to drive uh, this, this, the things that we just talked about. And so it's, you know, everything evolves over time. For those of you that have been around for a long period of time, you know, we've been, you know, started back 25 years ago when you had the HSRC, and then it evolved through a sort of an entire quality framework uh, and, and plan that evolved through ECFA. Like it, it's gone in, in sort of layers of evolution over 20 years. I think we're really at a state now where most governments and most bodies that provide policy direction are really embracing around how do we create a standard that's going to drive in a, in a province. And as I said, you're seeing this in Alberta, you're seeing this in other provinces. I think you're going to see it in Ontario and it's already started to some extent. And so I don't think it's a lack of leadership. I think in part, it's how do we structure ourselves for the next 10 years? It's going to get us to a better place, you know, in the, and that, this is a journey. There's nothing here where you can roll some out over three weeks and everybody's good. Like it's a it's a three to three to seven year plan. And I think what we're starting to see some edges around that plan that's going to evolve. And then there's going to have to be an execution strategy to drive that compliance and adoption over the course of most likely five years. Um, and if we can stay on that, on that, you know, keep that hand on the tiller that way. I think there's a lot of things that can really improve dramatically in terms of how technology is embraced and standardized and used across the province. So um, as, as we sort of get involved and do more, there, there are a number of risks for deploying new technologies. Um, just going through some of the questions here, even, uh, you know, Michael Ford um, is asked about, you know, the hysteria about AI in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some of the, the, the failings and that sort of idea. So, when we're deploying new technology, when we're getting, you know, bringing in new stuff, how, how do we sort of, um, how do you mitigate those risks? Yeah, it's uh, a great question. I think that, uh, and there are risks with AI. I think they're, you know, I think they're fairly well understood. I certainly have seen uh, Ram Debert from the Citizen Lab present on using AI, you know, for, in this, in the context of the state. In the context of healthcare, I think it, you know, there's AI in that there's, you know, it's really about, about bias, about, you know, what is the comprehensiveness of the data that's actually used to underpin um, uh, some of the, the, some of the AI applications. Um, and that in turn, I think it impacts public trust and do they believe in, in the outputs? And I guess I see a few things. One is, uh, is transparency. And I think transparency um, is really important in order to be able to understand um, how AI is used and the assumptions and the data going in. I think co-design uh, with people and uh, certainly our group, when they thought about this, and this is, came out from the conference, is sort of co-design with you know, structurally marginalized groups as well so that they can see themselves uh, in, in the AI application and, and understand it. Um, and I think there's also a, a role for government to put in some guardrails like regulation. And I think there's been quite a lot of discussion about what is the, the regulatory environment within which AI um, needs to operate. And I'm sure governments are still getting their heads around, around that, but at some point that's going to be uh, required uh, in order to you know, protect the, 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 the rights of individual people to make sure that it's of a quality and Cam, you already talked a little bit about that and uh, to make sure that it, uh, any AI applications benefit everyone and doesn't deepen the inequities for people who already uh, are already mar marginalized or, or vulnerable. So those are the kinds of things I think we need to, to put into place. I don't have a regulatory plan necessarily in my head, but I think uh, we are at a point with this technology that it's, it's gonna be required. 
I'm not sure that, uh, you know, Jeff Hinton has suggested that we uh, we stop using AI for a period of time while we can understand it. I think, the you know, the horse has left the barn, but I think we do need to catch up from a public policy perspective. And uh, I think that's a then it's an appropriate role for, for government and to have conversation about what that regulation might look like. Yeah, I agree, Helen. I, I think to, to add to Helen's comments, Matt, um, <clears throat> you know, AI is, you know, is obviously a, a topic on everybody's mind. But I think if you just take sort of innovation and technology on any sphere, I, I think what's really important, one of the things we're very fortunate of in Ontario and Canada um, is the, the amount of data that we have. Mm -hmm. And so when you when you start talking about are we going to roll out this AI thing here, we're we going to roll out this piece of technology, before we just start buying, part of what you have to have is you've got to have sort of a, a formal way to assess value and risk before you say yay or nay. And I think what we've seen a lot of over the course of the last decade is some pretty robust frameworks that allow you to say, assess risk. So that's point one. Once, once you've done that and you identified the value proposition and it's going to make sense, then as you roll it out, you have to have the ability to monitor and evaluate from a quality perspective. And so I even look at, you know, it's not AI, it's, it's a little bit less dramatic, but if you look at when we started rolling out certain robotics, there was huge perspective of whether it was good or bad from an outcome perspective. The only reason we were able to evaluate it is because you have data and you have a quality framework and you've got a monitoring process to evaluate it. And what was interesting is some procedures made sense, some didn't. And so what you have is you've got a you've got a process by which you evaluate risk. We're going to need that with artificial intelligence, without question. This is not the type of thing where okay, we're going to partner with a vendor, we're going to roll it out, and all is going to be good. It's part of the innovation is how you evolve, but you've got to be able to manage the risk, and you've got to have an offshoot uh, if it's not going to work. Um, and so I think there's a some work around that framework, which I don't think is going to take a huge amount of time because it's pretty well established in many areas. It's whether you whether you apply it in a similar manner across the board. And then I think there's an ele other element that is the one that is um, is the real challenge from a change management perspective, is the perspective of rolling out these technologies and evolution and AI, is you may need less people in the future to do the work. So now you've got an issue in terms of what are you doing with various workforces and how you manage the change with unions? Does it change medical models in terms of how physicians build and do you need as many physicians to do certain types of things? And so there's a, as part of that value assessment is you've got to assess all those things up front because if you roll it out and leave everything else in place, you put great technology and you've just driven your costs through the roof. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to balance both of those out. And some of those discussions have to happen in advance as part of the preparatory work before you pull the pin. And I personally, I've seen that a lot within hospital environments. The technology is great. You roll it out, but you really haven't changed much. You've improved potentially the quality outcome, but you haven't necessarily changed what you should be doing from a process perspective that gives you the value return. And I think that's part of the challenge that has to be thought through with some of these things. Because uh, one thing for sure is we're, we're not going to have loads of money to keep adding and adding into this. We're going to have to go through some process change. And that's part of the change management that has to be thought about carefully as we deploy these. You're on mute, Matt. <laughs> I'm going to kind of see if um, I can get into some of the questions from the audience. And one, one right off the bat was the technology today, whether or not it be AI or virtual care, that sort of thing is, is is really taking us outside of the walls of the hospital, outside of the walls of our care system. Um, and I'm just, the question is more about, do you have any insights, any ideas, any thoughts on developing and creating an effective community partnership? I don't know who would want to take that one on. Go first, Tom. I mean, I hope that you know, I still see Ontario health teams, and people probably know some of my history in, in working on them, um, as a, a locus of coming together between all the partners of a healthcare system uh, in, a, in a geography. I think they're an evolution, um, and I think there are some outstanding uh, policy issues about governance and funding that probably are going to have to be addressed. But I still think that the venue on a geographic basis, um, including what 
Cam said about standards, but uh, the, the creating a, a geographic locus for that discussion and for that planning to occur still makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I agree, Helen. I think um, it's a good question, whoever asked it. Um, yeah. I, I'm a huge proponent of integrated healthcare systems. Um, personally, we have to stop talking about what we do in hospitals versus what we do in the community and start talking about how we're gonna integrate them together which means there needs to be a lot more time and effort spent on how we grow capacity in the communities and how hospitals enable that um, and bring some of the resources that are in hospitals into those community settings. Um, the challenge is, is when you start talking about in generalities, it feels like you're trying to boil the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what the approach that we've taken wrong or right is what we do for mental health is very different than what we do for surgery. Not wrong or right, it's just different. And so when you talk about surgical populations and what needs to be done in the hospital versus what uh, can be, uh, how you decrease length of stay and what can be cared for in the community or what you do with home care, you start to get a very clear path in terms of what you can do for a surgical population to integrate between community and home. Whereas mental health is a completely different program and service, not wrong, just different. And so what I find is the discussions we've been having either with the OHTs, for example, with community health centers, there are huge numbers of patients in hospital that have um, mental health issues that do not need to be in hospital. And so part of this is how do you create more capacity within community health centers and how does the hospital send psychiatrists down to community health centers and what technology can you put down there to support a community health center so that patients are cared for in there, but they always have, you know, if they're acutely ill, then they may have an episode where they're coming into hospital. And so I think, you know, breaking these down by programmatic population and start to look at this from a population health perspective is different than talking about how do you change the entire governance of the healthcare system, which is quite honestly is, you know, you can lose 10 years easily on something like that. Mm -hmm. But if you start breaking them down and you get groups together between community and hospitals and you stop talking about the two of them, you start talking about how we're going to care for a population, it becomes very clear where you need to invest and where technology can play a role. Uh, and what I'm finding more and more, at least in our place, and I'll stick with mental health, it's not because psychiatrists don't want to necessarily um, work in the community. It's because there's no there's no integration, there's no support. And so we're, we've got a lot of um, psychiatrists now that we're trying to move into community health centers because it's where, unfortunately, with marginalized and racialized populations, you have a lot of mental health aspects of care that are required. We're starting to beef up CHCs as much as we can, but they're they're integrated together. Uh, but a lot of it's built on a technology platform, whether it's virtual care, whether it's in-person care, whether it's trying to create a single chart, you start to do something around mental health. And I personally, I think that is, it's a way that you can actually start to make traction on some of these things, as opposed to talking in generalities in terms of how we restructure the system. Yep. You're, on, Matt. You're on mute, Matt. This time I actually hit mute instead of unmute. Uh, uh, so... We ha I have time for a couple more questions. So quickly, I'm just wondering about the engagement, um, when they are engaged and that sort of idea with your frontline core staff. So the nursing, you know, your nurses, when, when are they getting involved in any of these discussions and how are they engaged? Can we start with that, Helen? Why don't you start? Yeah. I think so, it's essential, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. And I think, um, number one, it's, 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 it's the only way that it can happen. Um, okay you know, and don't take this disrespectfully, but taking a bunch of administrators and IT people and putting them in the room to try and figure out how you care for mental health population, that is the that is the worst thing to do to start with. Um, part of what we tend to do is, um, and I'll stay on mental health, between the medical leadership, the clinical leadership, and then you bring, we put them in with the community members and start talking about how you create programs to move between community and hospital. Once they've identified how, what, what the opportunity is, then you can enable that with technology. Uh, but you know how you deal with a schizophrenic population versus first episode versus mobile crisis, the, the teams have to be engaged to structure how we're gonna provide care differently for the future between hospital and community. Same thing with surgery, same thing with Matt newborn, same thing with care of the elderly. And so I think you're starting to see more and more hospitals spend more time in the community to try and build that infrastructure because it's not sustainable for hospitals to keep doing what they're doing. We gotta we gotta ship what a hospital does. I'll just quickly add, I think there's also a role for patients and caregivers as well. 
and, totally. and to be part of the equation, part of the design, part of the deployment. There are a whole lot of tools that are useful uh, for them. And I think that really, um, that engagement is going to change the conversation. We had, you know, I guess between 10 and 15% patients at our conference and caregivers. It was magnificent. And, and their, their data literacy is, is really uh, quite outstanding in some cases. And so they're really going to be helpful to this. Can I just add to that, Matt? Yep. One's point is so important. The other interesting thing is when you get patients and families around this table and what information they actually need, it's often different what the providers think <laughs> they need. That's true. And so, you know, and technology in enables information. So it's an absolutely critical part to this. Mm -hmm. So we, we are out of time. Um, what I'm going to do right now is um, just basically go back to Helen and, and Cameron. And I don't know if you have a, a sort of 15 second sort of uh, wrap up on maybe how we learn more or how we get engaged um, and what's next. So Helen, maybe we'll, or sorry, Cameron, why don't we start with you? You know, just your very quick sort of what, what's next. So um, I think Matt, much like we saw with the Mac exercise, more engagement around these panels that cross the entire, all the sectors, bring patients and families together uh, and both locally and provincially I think is a very good start to start and understand where some of the, the opportunities and the challenges are at this point one. And then I think what comes next is also a discussion, ideally through government around what a, what the overall deployment strategy is with this in terms of how we're gonna draw, drive compliance and standards within the industry. Yeah. And here at AMS Healthcare, we're committed to helping make this, this big change, um, you know, more manageable by you know, funding our fellows, convening conversations. We have a whole bunch of podcasts on our website that are terrific. Uh, but I think it's it's really a, a, an area of focus for us. And uh, like like Longwoods, we hope that people will uh, will engage with us and will engage with leaders and hopefully bring some you know terrific speakers and ideas into the system that make implementation a smoother. And you'll see our, our report and some very good implementation ideas about where to start. And that'll be on our website shortly. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, again, those of you here today, um, we will make sure that you get a copy of the report once it's up on AMS Healthcare's uh, site. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks all.